Okay, welcome everyone. Um, if you can, please put yourself on mute so we don't have any other interfering noises. And I'm gonna share my screen and make a few introductions here. Um, I am I'm so excited about um, sharing this trip to Rwanda with all of you. And I, I um, my name is Jennifer Spots. I'm the founder of Global Family Travels. We're a company based in, uh, in Bellevue, Washington. And um, can everyone see my screen? You're good to, yeah, okay. Oh, good, okay, I wanna make sure. Um, next slide, okay. So um, just to get a review of our agenda here for today, we have a, a, lot, a lot to pack in. Um, my uh, Kelly, Kelly, Kelly McCoy, um, is going to be um, sharing most of most of the, the PowerPoint here. And Kelly is our uh, Global Family Travels in-house African specialist. And she'll say a few words about herself when, when I hand the mic over to her shortly. And then I'm so pleased to also introduce Emmanuel Muvini. Um, Muvani, sorry, I mispronounced your name. <laughs> um, and um, he, he's gonna also introduce himself, but we have been talking, Kelly, Emmanuel, and I probably for, gosh, three plus years yeah, or, about putting this trip together. And so I am just so delighted to finally, um, you know, see it all happen and very excited that there's been a lot of interest too. And I'm gonna share a little bit about global family travels with you. And then um, Kelly will give you the trip overview and, and then also Emmanuel will give a little background about, about Rwanda as well. So with that, um, we, um, Global Family Travels is a 12 year old company. We're based in the Seattle area in Bellevue, Washington. And we actually got started um, by working in, in India and in the, in the Himalayas and Ladakh. And we um, align a lot of our travel around community-based um, travel principles. And we have three travel pillars, learn, serve, and immerse. When you, when you travel, you learn about the country, the destination, the history, the challenges in the destination, and then um, about yourself. Sometimes when you're stepping outside of your comfort zone, you learn learn about yourself as well. Um, and then because we partner with nonprofit organizations, um, on most of our trips, we are able to offer very immersive, um, authentic experiences that sometimes have service learning components to it. And in, in the case of Rwanda, it's really supporting nonprofit organizations is, is, is what you'll, you'll learn in this PowerPoint. And so we offer a lot of different services, um, community-based trips, donor trips for nonprofits. We're actually working in the Seattle area, doing some day, day tours as well. And then African safaris that um, Kelly, Kelly manages. And then we're working um, with some clients who are doing around the world trips with, with purpose and then transformational journeys, which this Rwanda journey will is a transformational journey as well. Um, we do a lot of due diligence around the nonprofits we work with and just to make sure that the projects are re relevant and, and meaningful. We um, also align a lot of our trips around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And there are several goals um, in this Rwanda trip that um, we are really supporting gender equality, the health and wellness of the destination, and also some of the life on land and water. So and um, lots, of, lots of things to learn on this trip. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about regenerative travel principles because you know a lot many of these uh, trips now um, you know they, we we um, use the word regenerative and I wanted to share what that actually means. Basically, um, it ensures that the travel experiences that we design help to uh, are intentionally designed to improve social environmental systems and um, that um, all beings can thrive, nature and humanity. And so it also means putting the destination's needs at the heart of the tourism experience and then creating opportunities to inspire travelers to be stewards of, of the destination. So I can say a lot more about regenerative tourism, but I'm gonna get onto the next slide. So, um, you know, this, this, uh, retreat, this trip to Rwanda is one of many trips to empower, empower women that we've launched uh, starting in October with a retreat to Seattle and then to Bali in January. And then of course, Rwanda in February and, and Peru in, in May. And with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing for now. And I'm going to um, share uh, another PowerPoint with you that um, Emmanuel will, will talk about in a minute.
just go from here, six slideshow. I actually need to share that, sorry, share my screen again. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yeah, great. I can see great. That. Okay. Emmanuel, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. You, we know you're very busy and um, with all of the work you're doing with the refugees. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. It's really a privilege to be here today and uh, talking about the, the amazing Rwanda today. And uh, nice meeting you uh, all. And uh, thank you, Kelly, as well, for all the efforts and uh, the great work you do as well. Yeah, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, my name is Emmanuel. I'm um, the Deputy Director uh, for International Rescue Committee. Uh, IRC is one of the largest resettlement agencies globally, not only here in the US, but outside of the uh, US, Africa, Asia, and uh, Europe as well. Uh, I am the outgoing president of the Rwandan community here in the state of Washington. Uh, I've been leading the community for the past seven years. I serve also on the board of the uh, Department of Social and Health Services. My role is to bring uh, ideas, changes, and suggestions to the, to the uh, department to make sure that our communities are well served in order to meet their needs. Uh, today I'll be talking about Rwanda. I am originally from Rwanda. Uh, uh, Kelly, if you could uh, skip to the next slide. Uh, Rwanda has uh, four provinces uh, and uh, one uh, city is the capital city, which is called Kigali. Uh, in the Eastern Province, uh, we have the Eastern Province, Northern Province, Western Province, and the Eastern Province. Uh, would you skip to the next slide? Uh, as of uh, 2022, uh, Rwandans um, are about 13 uh, and 500 uh, million is our population. Next slide. Uh, I would like to uh, simplify and then uh, talk about Rwanda before colonization and uh, during colonization. Rwanda used to be a monarch. It used to be, we used to have uh, kings and each region used to have its own king. But um, during a colonization, Rwanda was originally ruled by German. Uh, but later on, they lost it to, and then handed over to Belgians. Uh, when Belgians uh, came on board, they um, brought a system of divide and rule, just to make sure that they have control of the population, where they uh, uh, sympathize to see as their favorites, uh, comparing to Hutus. At that time, Tutsis were the minorities, and the Hutus were the majority. That time it was about the uh, same as of today, like 20% of Tutsis and 80% uh, of uh, uh, Hutus. Uh, in 1926, Belgium introduced ethnic ID, IDs where they wanted to uh, identify people from uh, based on their uh, clans and uh, tribes. Uh, we were given IDs, uh, they find us whether you're Tutsi or Hutu, uh, they wanted to make sure that they know who you are. Uh, 1950s, you know, as uh, Tutsis were favored by the Abergians, they were given also opportunities to be educated. They were given a proper education, sent outside of the country to uh, go to schools or within inside the country uh, they were given chances to go um, uh, get basic education comparing to majority of uh, Hutus. Next slide. Uh, Belgians turned their back and uh, uh, started to favor the majority Hutus instead of Tutsis because uh, Tutsis after being educated, they started complaining. They started asking questions about how they are being ruled or 
how their, the colonization was not really working for them. Uh, in 1962, uh, Belgium withdrew from Rwanda. That's when uh, July 1st, Rwanda got independence. And next slide. After the independence, Rwanda was declared as a republic ruled by the majority of Hutus. Um, Hutus, you know, they were not happy based on uh, 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 the history of Belgians and the Tutsis, uh, they felt like they wanted to do a revenge. They led uh, really some uh, 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 very extreme, uh, you know, uh, massacres within the country. And some uh, during the uh, 1980s, uh, Tutsis started fleeing the country to the neighboring countries. Uh, next slide. Uh, the former president used RPF. Uh, RPF is the Ronald Patrick Front, which was uh, a movement which was formed in, during 1980s when Rwandans were established in the neighboring countries. They started also negotiating with the ruling uh, uh, regime to let them come back to the country because they felt like being refugees for more than a decade. Or, or more than two decades were not what they wanted to do. They started negotiating with the, uh, uh, the current, uh, uh, the former uh, regime, which was led the former president who was killed uh, during the, uh, uh, during the, when the, his plan was uh, uh, shot, when he was coming back from the peace talk. Uh, uh, the formation of the rebellion, uh, the former president used it as uh, an excuse to start, uh, to start hunting Rwanda Tutsi, the minorities in the country, uh, and the civil war was not proclaimed, but it was happening within inside. 1990, when the rebellion of the Rwanda Patrick Front invaded Rwanda, that is the official civil war uh, proclaimed. Ethnic tensions began to increase. They had deluge that Tutsi wanted to enslave again. Uh, Hutus uh, started within the country. People were educated to start to increase hatred for Tutsis. Amongst the fighting, a ceasefire was um, declared during 1993 uh, for a peaceful negotiation. Next slide. However, on April 6, during when the peaceful negotiation talk was going on, uh, the former Rwandan president plan was shot down in Kigali. That is the main excuse the regime brought up to start implementing the genocide ideology. A mass killing started uh, from the first day the uh, plan was shot down. Hut authorities planned the mass killings in advance, they were not happy to see the president agreeing to talk with the uh, RPF at first place. Next slide. Uh, mass killings were organized. Most victims were killed in their own villages because people knew each other from your village, your neighbor, where you went to school, where you went to work, they knew you. Uh, women were raped, also used, uh, no, rape was used uh, it was a weapon during genocide. More than 400,000 400, women were raped during the genocide against Tutsis. It was one of the most horrible uh, atrocities uh, the world has ever uh, seen. And next slide. An estimated 10,000 people were uh, uh, murdered on, on a daily basis. An estimated of uh, uh, more than 1 million of Tutsi were killed only in 90 days. Rwanda has counted more than 450,000 of children left as orphans. Next slide, please. Uh, Rwanda was left with a crisis amongst children, widows, um, many of which we were either orphaned or forced to join in, to, to join in massacre, leaving them with really one of the haunting memories. Rwanda has faced one of the outbreak uh, uh, AIDS crisis uh, due to mass rape that occurred during the genocide against Tutsi. Next slide. Uh, after genocide, however, Rwanda now looks towards the future. 
uh, by promoting forgiveness. Rwanda is now considered as a success story after the genocide. I'm quite sure many of you have read about successful stories about Rwanda, uh, about unity and uh, reconciliation. Next slide. Uh, Rwanda now is considered the first growing economy in Africa, the sixth uh, safest country in the world uh, for travelers. Rwanda now is ranked uh, second for doing business in Africa. Uh, it is unbelievable that only 28 years uh, ago, Rwanda is now considered among the most successful stories among African countries. Uh, most of African countries are really uh, 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 suffering from uh, corruption and uh, civil wars as we speak right now. Uh, most women in parliament uh, in gender, Rwanda is ranked, the, uh, we, uh, I think is ranked number one in, in uh, promoting a women's uh, uh, equality. Uh, we have now 61% in uh, uh, decision-making uh, uh, seats in the, in the country. Next slide, please. Uh, what lessons uh, could we learn from uh, Rwanda's experience? They have a strong political will and vision leadership, uh, emphasizing and thinking big on uh, and, uh, and uh, keeping an eye on the bigger picture, promoting equity and, uh, uh, and uh, development for uh, 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 rural Rwandan, uh, Rwandans. Strong governance and coordination structures, you know, like zero tolerance of corruption. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, um, there's openness among leadership. There's also moving policy from planning to action, implementation of uh, systems. You know, like there's also talking, but also action is one of the failure most of countries have really been facing. Rwanda is one of the countries which has really, really uh, put a lot of efforts into uh, planning uh, an action to implementation of uh, their action plan. Inclusive development, you know, Rwanda has uh, done the most amazing thing to do decentralization of leadership, you know, from uh, the cell, 10 houses where they have their own leader, where they uh, uh, solve uh, uh, community issues starting from the grassroots, not only to go uh, uh, way beyond in the top leadership. Uh, the private sector, uh, Rwanda has promoted a private sector, you know, uh, individuals uh, in the private sector were given chances also to grow the businesses, of course, with the support of the Rwanda Development Board. Uh, funds were collected and uh, banks were uh, mobilized to support local uh, um, business people. Next slide. That's that's the last one. <laughs> the last yeah, one. Yeah, but thank I think you. the last one was the Q and A. Just to hear from people. Oh yeah, Q &A. and A. And then, um, do you want to? Um, people, we can take questions now, or we can just do the Q and A. Are you staying on for the for the rest of the show? <laughs> uh, if uh, you know, it's really uh, important to have this this background, and and um, you know, it's um, it's a very touching, moving. Obviously, a lot of um, heartfelt and. Um, difficult things to learn about on, on this journey. So it'll, uh, but you know, the, the good thing is that there, there's resilience there and there's so many amazing stories to, to, to tell uh, about Rwanda. So I'm going to share the screen again and hand, um, hand this over to Kelly for a second. Um, Actually, Jennifer, <clears throat> can I share my screen first before we go to that next? Sure. One? Sure. Okay. Hold on. Oh, hmm. okay. Hold on. Okay. Okay, can everyone see my screen? And so what I wanted to give context to is when many people, first of all, think of Africa, they think of Africa as one country. Well, Africa is made up of 54 different countries. And um, I have been traveling to Africa since 2004. And Rwanda was actually my second trip in 2008. And um, as you can see, Rwanda is literally in the heart of Africa. 
and um, and what was so special uh, about the first time that I went, um, you can see behind me, it's also known as the Land of a Thousand Hills. So I'm going to move my head. And uh, these are actually up in a northern province, and that's where, when I went, my focus was really um, about nature and getting to know um, the people, but I went gorilla trekking. And so um, the one thing that, was, uh, that I learned on the trip was um, a lot about truth and reconciliation. Um, I had luckily, my first trip to Africa was in South Africa, and that was at the 10-year anniversary of the free vote. And so then being able to experience uh, Rwanda and having come off of just um, 14 years after the genocide and really um, seeing how um, in a country that was split and divided apart, people, uh, people coming back together and having forgiveness, neighbors killed neighbors and those neighbors now have reconciled and forgiven each other. And that just, I think, taught me and that, I think that's kind of what helped me kind of grow in, in empathy and, and sharing and being with different people. And so I think that is what makes um, this little country so mighty and powerful um, with its place in the world. And it's and it's just really, really a special place. And the other thing that I love is that there are so many women. When I, again, when I went, uh, I went to go gorilla trekking um, in the United States, most of our national park system is um, made up of, at the time, mostly men. Um, and to see that the national park at that time was headed by a woman, it was one of the first countries that banned plastic. You can't even, couldn't even bring it into the country. And now there's other countries in Africa that are doing the same thing. It's one of the most pristine countries. Um, so there's a lot going on in Rwanda. And I, and I was really excited to uh, meet Emmanuel um, because I didn't know how big our population, our Rwandan community here was here in um, Seattle. So um, uh, Emmanuel, I want to thank you for your time and all of the amazing work that you do with the International Rescue Committee. Um, um, it's been great. And so um, I'm going to let you kind of drive the slides now, Jennifer, and we'll um, talk a little bit more about our trip. Great. Okay, let me just navigate over there. Everybody see that? And then, um, I'm going to skip over to the we'll talk. We can go over the pricing part, but I think the dates are dates are important to share. Too, so. Yeah. So um, again, like Jennifer said, um, this particular we've been working on. Uh, when I first met Jennifer, it was 2016, and we just had a like-minded way and a kind of kindred spirit about how we like to travel and the kind of programs that we focus on and putting together um, trips. And it's really focused on what does the community wanna show? Um, when we um, kind of started and just before um, Jennifer started the company, a lot of tourism was really based about kind of big groups going somewhere, seeing a destination from a bus and not really connecting with the community. And so what we really focus on is really trying to make sure that people are immersed and that they can learn something and then there's opportunity to give back to the place that they're visiting. So um, this experience in Rwanda is going to start February of next year, which is really exciting because it's like springtime. Um, East Africa, we, you definitely want to visit East Africa before April because April is uh, one of the heavy wet seasons. And so we are um, in, a, in a time where it's nice, lush and, and green still. And so this trip is about nine days and there's an option to add on gorilla trekking if you want. And um, Gorilla checking is a whole different experience, but when people ask me like what my favorite favorite country is or experience in Africa, because a lot of people ask me, don't you get tired of going on safari? Well, no, because every country is different. Um, you learn there are over 3000 languages um, in Africa as, as a continent. And even within Rwanda, there's um, various tribes that speak various languages. And so you get a lot of different culture. Um, and even in Rwanda, there's one of the oldest people groups on the continent. And that's also the Twa people that are in the uh, Western border um, of Rwanda. Um, so basically the price of this trip for the nine days uh, starts at 39.85. And um, uh, Jennifer, when we end, we talk about the gorilla um, extension. We'll talk about that at the end, okay? Next slide, please. 
And so um, our learning uh, themes that are unique to this tour is um, you'll learn um, a little bit more about the history of Rwanda um, with a focus on really the healing that's come in the last uh, 28 years. And so this week um, was a day of remembrance um, on, I believe, uh, Wednesday, it was the 6th or Tuesday was the 6th. And um, so there was a lot of festivities and activities that happened around that. You'll get to also experience women-led initiatives and NGOs in the community. And you'll learn more about the peace and reconciliation um, collaborative movements that happen and how neighbors get together and um, heal. And then we will also be visiting several um, organizations as well. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jennifer. And so our service uh, experience, which is a way to really uh, kind of break bread with people and get to know um, locals, is we'll be visiting uh, three different organizations. The first one is the Niam, Niam and pr forgive me if I uh, pronounce it wrong, so Emmanuel, I'm going to lean to you to correct me. <laughs> uh, the Niam Marimbo Women's Center. We'll also be visiting the Mbutu Foundation and the Eurogo Women's um, Forum. And that is a, a organization that's sponsored by the second, uh, the first lady of Rwanda. And it's an empowerment um, and it helps build entrepreneurial skills as well as um, uh, life skills for um, youth all into um, womanhood. So um, it's a multi-generational organization. Next slide, please. And so um, our journey starts um, with flights from the United States and we arrive on day one in Kigali, which is the vibrant capital, um, which is a beautiful, uh, I think of uh, Kigali as a garden city. Um, there's, it's lush, it's filled with fountains. Um, uh, it's really a pretty place. So you'll check into the hotel and uh, be met by our partner at the airport and then transfer it to um, our hotels. And then we'll kick off day two in the morning with a group breakfast and we'll be meeting our tour partner um, in Rwanda that will give us an orientation of kind of what to expect every day in a little bit more detail. And one of the things that we drive to is we kind of flow with whatever's happening in the country. So we'll have a plan that says day one we're doing this, but if there's something else that's happening, there might be some slight adjustments along the way. Um, and then one cool thing that will happen is we'll be met by a local historian that will go a little bit more in depth about the places we're going to see and the history of the area. And then our first stop um, to kind of kind of get everything level set is the Kigali Genocide Museum. And um, it is moving. It is hard. Um, the one thing that we intentionally do on this itinerary is make sure we balance all the hard stuff with life affirming stuff as well. Um, but you can't just, um, you can't brush over the history of the area. You will find very much, very many parallels to things that happen in the United States as well as around the world. Like before we hopped on, Emmanuel and I were just talking about um, what's happening in Ukraine, obviously, and what's happened, you know, in Syria. and. Um, and while um, most of East Africa was not necessarily part of the Atlantic slave trade, there are parallels to things that happen in the United States. And so you'll start connecting these kind of dots and there is a African philosophy which started in Southern Africa called Ubuntu. And, Ru and uh, Emmanuel, what is it called in Rwanda? Is the term Ubuntu? Do you use the term Ubuntu? So yeah, essentially, it's Ubuntu actually. It's Ubuntu. the same with the M. Ubuntu. Yeah, they say, but it's whatever pronunciation that they understand, but it's Ubuntu. Yeah. And so what that means is I am because you are. And so we're all wrapped up in each other's humanity. And you will get the sense of that um, from this experience. Um, so after we visit uh, the, the Genocide Museum, we will have a guided tour of the city of Kigali and um, you'll be able to uh, do a little local shopping, which is always fun, taste local food. Um, we will have a little bit of language. So you'll little, learn a little bit about Kirwandan language, um, which has a lot of uh, consonants and it rolls. Uh, there's a lot of silent things and I'll, um, we'll go over that. That'll be part of our prep before the trip happens as well. And um, so you can go to the next slide, Jennifer, please. Day three. 
So then day three will be our first visit to the, one of the um, NGOs, the Niambo Women's Center in Kigali. And this uh, NGO was launched in 2007 by Rwandese women. And it was the mission is to address gender-based violence, gender inequality, and discrimination. It's basically an empowerment organization. Um, there is a lot of education that is given uh, to women, vocational training, um, financial literacy, and again, giving them, because the, con because the country um, went through the genocide and a lot of the women had to, um, because it was a patriarchal society at one time, so now women were empowered to kind of stand on their own and create new businesses, and um, this is what this organization does. Um, later that afternoon, we'll also, um, our local partner will also um, walk us through the liveliest area of the city in one of the oldest residential areas. You'll be able to um, visit mosque. You'll be able to check out a Rwandan hair salon because, you know, we always like hair. We always got to look good. And um, that's one of the things as African-American visiting countries in Africa, there's always a place to get your hair done. And it just reminded me of being in the neighborhood that I grew up in because there's always the, the hair shop. Um, so visit uh, hair salons, tailoring workshops. One of the uh, my favorite parts about Africa is the beautiful fabric. And um, everyone is always dressed so colorfully. And as you see, like the woman um, with the orange and red um, turban on, head wrap on, she's got a beautiful turquoise dress. So you'll be able to see um, creations come to work from those fabrics. Um, there's also handicraft shops. Um, I own one of the friendship baskets, which were kind of one of the symbols of Rwanda. And you'll see basket weaving. There's all kinds of beautiful, um, handicrafts and things. And so that day is just kind of really being immersed in kind of being a local um, after visiting with this NGO. And then um, after lunch, we'll visit the um, Mbutu Foundation and we'll be taking uh, the uh, taking a tour there. And that is, this is a foundation that focuses on women on health and um, healthy lifestyles. And so we'll learn, learn, learn a little bit more about that that first day. So it's all about just getting immersed in the Kigali um, community. Next slide, please. And then um, day four, we head off to FA, the girls' school, um, as well as a local um, honey maker named Sheila. She has her own um, micro business. And then the Kiramonko Market. Emmanuel, did I say that right? Yes, it's Kimironko. Kimironko. Yeah. Um, and so again, uh, FA was an organization that is founded by the First Lady, and um, there's actually 34 chapters all over uh, Rwanda, and um, it's membership based, and it's um, one of the um, actually continents um, NGOs uh, as well, and so you'll find it in other countries as well as all over Rwanda. Um, and then we visit again the honey farm and Sheila's Honey, um, which is a um, Ubuntu women's uh, farmer endeavor. So you'll be able to help support a local business and the local market. Next slide, please. Okay, and so so day um, days two through four are all about Kigali, but then when we um, go to, excuse me, stay on the map, please. So then when we hit, um, Day five, we start heading out of Kigali and we start heading southwest to one of our first national parks, Ngui National Park. Wait, Nyungwe National Park, excuse me. <laughs> um, and so next slide, please. And on the way uh, there, we'll also be visiting um, two of the cities that are one of the um, kingdoms prior to colonization. And the first one is Nyanza, and the second one is Huwe. And so you'll learn, you'll get to see a little bit more about what life was, was like prior to colonization during like the Iron Age and um, centuries uh, between um, the Iron Age and colonization. And that in itself is fascinating. Like I mentioned, one of the oldest people groups in the entire continent of Africa were originally from Rwanda. Um, and so once we arrive um, into the uh, forest, um, we will be um, met and have lunch with this group that is the Ngomo Nishia. Um, Manuel, did I say it right? I think I messed that one up. <laughs> no, no, it's Ngomo Nishia. Yeah, Go a shot. little bit hard to pronounce. It is because you it's really it sounds like a, yeah. okay. Yeah. So they are a women's another women's empowerment group um, that is more rural, but they became um, prior to the genocide only men were allowed to drum, 
And drum is, you know, one of the heartbeats of the entire continent. And so to have a women's group that is known worldwide for their drumming, um, this organization, what year was it started, Emmanuel? You mean the women's one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I'm not quite sure about when, uh, because they could have started back in days because of that... Uh, uh, it was not allowed for women to drum. drum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but uh, let me say uh, 2014, mm -hmm. around so there. Years after. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, 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 just to let you know that um, those who are in Seattle and then want also to experience this, we have a very, very wonderful a group of women drummers here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. That's for your information. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. I might hold you up to that. We'll be calling you. <laughs> um, and so we'll, that'll be our welcome and we'll have lunch and then we'll be spending the next um, couple of days in the forest on a couple of different experiences. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to have you go to the next slide. And uh, our next day actually is a, um, so one of the, um, uh, what Rwanda is known for is the land of a thousand hills. And so as we drive out to the more rural areas outside of Kigali, you'll begin to see this. And it's just, um, uh, if you've ever seen like Gorillas in the Mist or other nature um, shows about Rwanda, you'll see just all the different levels of hills. And it's one of the most, I think one of the most beautiful places in the world. Uh, you'll be, you'll have an opportunity to do a canopy walk through the top of the forest, which is very cool. And then um, Rwanda is also known for tea as well as coffee. And you'll see tea farms along the way. And so we have an optional experience for those who want to learn about um, Rwandan tea and tea making and growing, there's optional experience for that as well. That's pretty cool. I think that was actually one of my favorite souvenirs was uh, tea. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so day seven, um, we uh, head, we start heading back north um, towards uh, Kigali. And um, on the way there, we will stop at the Interama and Niyamata Genocide Memorial Churches. And these churches are the places where people found refuge. Um, in some cases during the genocide and other places they became um, mass um, places. So um, we'll pay respects there. And then we will also visit a reconciliation village, which you'll see firsthand how truth and reconciliation um, um, ceremonies happen in the process of that. Um, and holding those who did harm accountable, but also giving forgiveness to, to folks. Um, to, if we have time, um, there's also a long way back up towards Kigali, an herbal ecotourism park. Um, and so depending on how our day goes, we always kind of play that by ear. If people want to stay um, longer in one place or another, and the majority wants to stay longer, then we'll adjust and, and go from there. Um, so that is day seven. Next slide. And then day eight, uh, so day seven, we uh, start heading out back up towards Kigali. And then day eight, we head um, more northeast. And then we go out to Akagera National Park, which is when we'll actually have a safari. Along the way there, we'll stop at Agahazo Shalom Youth Village and the Urugu Women's Opportunity Center. And so that will give us the opportunity to meet again with more um, sustainable uh, growers um, that are helping to farm in an environmentally friendly way. And then it'll be the opportunity to do a little coffee tasting uh, with Rwandan coffee and um, learn a little more about a couple more NGOs. Uh, next slide, Jennifer. And so um, as we head out to Akagera National Park um, has some indigenous animals. You'll see most of the big five. You won't see all of the big five. In fact, um, in the last couple of years, uh, some species have, be, have been re reintroduced to, to this park, but it's one of the, um, uh, one of the prettiest safari parks in Africa. And what's nice is you don't have as much traffic as you would in say um, Nairobi and Kenya or South Africa. So you kind of get the experience to yourself, um, but you'll be mesmerized with all the uh, flora and fauna. If you're a bird nerd like me, you'll be happy. <laughs> There's all kinds of bird life as well, as well as um, uh, Columbus monkeys and different primates. 
Um, so we start off, safaris always start off early in the morning and there's typically usually a morning uh, safari, an afternoon safari, and sometimes an evening safari. And there's breaks in between for rest and relaxation. You'll just get to experience different parts of the parks. Um, and the reason why there's usually uh, multiple safaris in a day is because animals act differently throughout the day. So you'll get to see um, a nesting, so to speak, um, in the morning and you'll see hunting more at dusk and going into the evening. Um, and then you'll see um, animals kind of grazing or being lazy in, in, in the afternoon. <laughs> kind of like humans. <laughs> um, next slide, please. And um, day 10 is the day that um, you start your journey back home or um, you can spend um, some of that time, depending on the flight time, shopping and hanging out in Kigali. Um, and then if you want, we do have an additional extension, um, again, gorilla trekking. And just to give an idea of the um, accommodations that we'll be staying in, um, in Kigali, uh, you can go to the next slide, sorry, Jennifer. Um, so we have the Hotel Shailando, which is in the heart of Kigali, and it's a really nice space with gardens. And again, this is kind of what you'll see throughout the city of Kigali is the a, a beautiful landscaping and gardening. And um, next slide. Our other um, lodging facility is Akagera Game Lodge. And I think we're missing the lodging accommodation for down in the forest, but again, it's another type of game lodge as well. And so what's cool about the game lodges is you have the opportunity to kind of uh, see the landscape. And um, there's usually sometimes uh, where we'll depart actually on a walking safari that's usually kind of an afternoon activity that would come from the game lodge as well. Um, and then for next slide. And um, if you're interested in gorilla trekking, um, so this is actually the scene that's behind my head. <laughs> this is Volcanoes National Park. It is um, on the border of the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. And um, the third mountain to the left is where Diane Fossey's um, camp is. And uh, Ellen DeGeneres has uh, invested quite a bit of money to uh, maintain um, the research center that's there. Um, I personally have climbed the second mountain um, and gorilla trekking is an experience. You have to learn, how, that's how I learned how to hike. And um, at the time I did it, it was 200 pounds. Um, I got up the mountain, it was hard, but once I got up there, it was totally worth it. Um, gorilla trekking can take anywhere from two hours to six hours, depending on where the gorillas are. Um, so it's a pretty cool experience and a, and a good way to kind of stretch out your legs and appreciate the nature and the communities that are around. Um, the one thing that Gorilla Trekking has done, um, as well as the other initiatives um, in the country for rural populations, is actually helped to employ rural communities. And, one, and um, many of the people that are now conservationists and um, park rangers were at one time poachers in the same forest. So it's kind of helped to kind of regenerate um, economies, livelihoods, as well as um, save the mountain gorillas. At the time that I went, there were only 600 mountain gorillas in the world, and now there's almost up to a thousand. So that's how the protecting of uh, this forest um, has impacted um, that species. Um, next slide, Jennifer. And um, Jennifer, you want to hop on and talk about next steps and where we are there? And that's a high level. Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm going on this trip, no doubt. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, anyway, yeah, just to, I'm going to put after I stop sharing the screen, I'll put the link to some of these trips um, in the chat here. But you can also use that QR code on the screen if you have your phone, and it'll open up to the four the where the four trips are, and then you can navigate to the Rwanda and go there. But I'll also put it in the chat. Um, and then um, I know we already have actually somebody who's already um, put a deposit and, um, and one person already signed up. So we're super excited about, about this trip. Um, you, uh, there's a booking form under the tasks as well. And then um, we'll also be in touch with you about all of the rest of the forms and passports and all of that as well. Um, and then you can also email us at info at Global Family Travels if you have specific qu questions after. We'll do a Q&A here shortly, um, and then we'll be in touch with you. But let me um, stop sharing the screen, and I'm going to stop recording as well, and then we can um, 
Actually, maybe if there are any high level pressing questions, I'll record them and then we'll stop stop recording. Anyone have any questions? No? No questions. No. So I'll see you all in Rwanda. <laughs> I have a question. I just didn't know if it was a high, a high level pressing question. <laughs> so I, don't know. I didn't know what the, you know, like, where does my question fall? Um, I was just curious about how many people you need to have the trip happen and um, how much the add on was for the gorilla trip. Gorilla, yeah. Much, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can address the number of people. I think we've budgeted, I mean, the budget like is 10 people. I mean, um, you know, if we have nine people, we you know probably can. So yeah, we're hoping to kind of at least cover all of our costs with nine to 10 people. Um, so, and we'll, you know, cap it at, um, I would say like no more than 15. We don't like to use big tour buses. So we're 12 to 15 is kind of the ideal number. I mean, if Kelly keeps it as our trip leader and then if I go <laughs> or yeah. um, Nicole, Nicole here, we're already scheming. We might <laughs> share a room. So yeah. Wow. yeah <laughs> anyway, just make sure we keep it intimate. And so that there's sometimes when your group gets too big, you don't have that same connection with people. And so we've always kind of been on most of our trips, like no more than 15. So right. like into, you know, 10 to 12 is usually our sweet spot. Yeah. And then as far as the uh, gorilla trekking, um, we have to look at those numbers as far as cover and cost go there. Um, you want to say Generally, a few so It's the, expensive. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, back when I went gorilla trekking, it was $500 for the permit because you have to. So um, the one thing that is the that I appreciate the most about gorilla trekking is they limit how many people can go um per day and they put you in groups based off of your physical ability so like i said i was 200 pounds never hiked before and that's why i learned started to learn how to hike <laughs> um the person i went with was like you want to go gorilla trekking i'm like gorilla what what is that and so um so i had to do some learning and um then we actually went twice and um both times were just like i it's um beyond getting connecting with the people it's kind of a it's kind of a, a once in a lifetime kind of experience. Um, so that was 2008. Now the permits are $1,500 for each trek. And so um, that is where most of that cost will come in. And then there's two nights um, in a hotel. And one of the hotels that we have lined up is actually um, the hotel that Jack Hanna um, used to stay in when he was doing a lot of work in Rwanda. It's called, um, oh gosh, I think it's called the Gorilla. I can't remember that name one. And um, right now um, it just got renovated and it is beautiful. Um, so we're still in the midst of kind of finalizing those numbers. So it's anywhere from additional like two to $3,000 for the two, to two extra days. And again, most of that money goes um, to the, the permit, which goes into the conservation of protecting the gorillas in the forest. Yeah, so I mean, we have, um, we had about 12 people registered um, for this. So we'll, you know, there's a lot of interest right now. I'm going to stop recording.